The case had been cold for almost 25 years when advanced DNA technology breathed new life into it. The suspect was nabbed, the arrest was celebrated, and the family began to find relief. But did they have the right man? This is the story of Richard Knapp, the strangler who was arrested and then freed. Hi friends, I'm Katie, and this is Katie Does Crime. Thank you for joining me for the first time if you're new here, and hello to the usual rapscallions and reprobates. Please consider subscribing or joining me on Patreon if you'd like to hear more true crime stories. If you're a true crime fan, I imagine that you, like me, just absolutely love to see a cold case solved. But today's case is a little different because it was solved and then unsolved. On July 17, 1994, at 7.45 p.m., police in Vancouver, Washington, were summoned to the apartment of Audrey Annette Hayline Frazier by a 911 call from a neighbor. Her lifeless body was visible through a window. Born on April 24, 1968, in Aberdeen, South Dakota, she had lived in the Vancouver area for 15 years. She had been a soprano in the high school choir and was a student at Clark College. She was separated from her husband, Dennis, at the time of the murder. They found the 26-year-old strangled and assaulted that day in 1994, leaving her five-year-old son without a mother. Authorities were able to collect some DNA from Audrey's body at the time that ultimately could be traced back to multiple sources. They talked to some persons of interest, but none of the suspects matched the DNA. Over the following years, more people were compared to the profile locally, and it was also sent to a national registry to check for hits. Still nothing. But in 2018, authorities contacted a Virginia company called Parabon Nanolabs, which provides genealogy services. They're the go-to for police forces working on cold cases, and they were able to develop a composite of what the suspect might have looked like then and would look like nearly 25 years later. Hair color, eye color, even freckles would be included in the so-called snapshot of the murderer. For about $6,800, they made this snapshot and added a genetic profile to one of the public databases. Immediately, they got hits on people who were closely related to the suspect and were able to narrow down a family tree. It was similar to the data that led to the takedown of the Golden State Killer in 2018. They made a list and waded through the potential matches based on things like age and location, and they narrowed it down to one suspect. And that was a really good suspect. Richard Eugene Knapp. The 57-year-old had lived in Clark County at the time of Audrey's murder, and to add to that, he'd once pleaded guilty and been convicted of assault of a sexual nature in 1986. His victim had been strangled, just like Audrey Frazier was. Apparently, Knapp and a roommate had been drinking at a party, and the woman offered to drive them home. He then kindly offered to walk her back to her apartment. But along the way, he assaulted her and strangled her to the point that she almost lost consciousness. The worst part is that her baby, who was only a year old, was with her through all of this. Knapp received 12 months in jail and was made to attend a rehab program for alcoholism. He only ever served 60 days of his sentence and also violated the rules of the program several times before eventually completing it. Knapp had actually given a DNA sample back then as part of the conviction, but no national database existed at the time. It was never uploaded to any database and was eventually destroyed for some reason. At the time of his recent arrest, Knapp was now living in Fairview, Oregon, just across the border from Vancouver. He was working in the area near the Portland airport. Detectives were on Knapp's trail for months, waiting to surreptitiously collect some DNA from him. They said he mostly just went to work and then went home, but they finally got their chance when he dropped a cigarette butt. See, that's what you get, litter bug. Just kidding, I'm not actually sure if he dropped it on the ground or in a trash can. But when they tested the cigarette, they found that it was a match for the DNA left in Audrey at the crime scene. Authorities stopped Knapp in his car one day and arrested him. In April 2019, police held a news conference to announce the findings. They weren't able to determine a motive because Knapp and Audrey didn't seem to have any reason to know each other. But what an amazing first step to bringing peace to a family whose questions had been weighing on them for decades. One of the detectives went to meet Audrey's son, who had been only five years old at the time of her murder, in person to tell him the amazing news. The family was understandably pained by the wound being reopened, but they were thankful to the detectives for continuing to work this case almost 25 years later. At his first appearance in court in May 2019, Knapp wore a smock meant to prevent him from hurting himself. I hadn't seen one of these before and just thought it was so Oregonian of him to show up to court in a puffy vest, but I'm dumb. 
His attorney said it was wrong of him to be shackled in court, especially while being photographed, that it would sway public opinion and the potential jury pool, so the judge ruled that he could forego the cuffs. Bail was set at $1 million. At the end of 2022, the now 60-year-old Richard Knapp was finally set to go to trial on first- and second-degree murder with sexual motivation charges. But an old suspect was given a new deposition that threw everything into upheaval. The suspect was Audrey's neighbor at the time of her murder at the Family Tree Apartments. And in what was apparently a drastic change of story, he admitted for the first time that the two were intimate on the night she died. It turns out his semen was one of the samples found in Audrey, and it was matched to him as far back as 2017. And yet he wasn't arrested like Knapp was. He was also the one to make the 911 call after Audrey's death, which either makes him look completely innocent or like one of those criminals who likes to insert himself into the investigation. It's unclear if he was ever even considered a suspect. There was also someone who's being called an eyewitness who was only recently tracked down in Georgia and interviewed. The defense wouldn't share the allegedly critical information this witness shared, but the police said they were aware of him. They just never called him. Knapp's attorneys say the police failed to do their due diligence because they saw the DNA evidence as a silver bullet. One attorney said, it's in my mind, a constant reminder that law enforcement can't forgo good police work because they have a new toy or a new theory. I'm not sure I would call DNA testing a new toy, but I mean, yes, you never want police to get hung up on one suspect. Knapp said that he was a bit of a playboy back in the day and had numerous relationships with numerous women. He was also into drugs and alcohol at the time. And he said that sure, he used to go to the same bars Audrey did, but none of this proved he'd done anything wrong, even the DNA. It proved he was there, sure, but on the night of the murder, not necessarily. Knapp's attorneys believe the Vancouver police ultimately had good intentions. They just failed to see past their blinders. DNA technology is immensely powerful, but it's not a silver bullet. And if it is not used in the proper way in conjunction with competent police work, you're going to end up with more situations like this. Prosecutors felt like reasonable doubt had been introduced and that it was their ethical duty to dismiss the case. On November 30th, 2022, after 1,312 days, Knapp was released from Clark County Jail, where he was being held. However, his case was dismissed without prejudice, meaning he could be brought back in if further evidence points his way. Knapp has maintained his innocence all along. In a sad turn of events, his wife died in June 2021 while he was in jail, maybe wrongfully. The deputy prosecuting attorney said, We know that we either released a killer from jail, or we released an innocent person who was wrongly held for three years. We know that one of those things happened, and that is not an easy decision to make. Knapp's lawyer says he's overwhelmed by the outcome. I can't imagine how difficult this has been on Audrey's family, who thought they might never see any resolution to this case in their lifetimes. To have to see it solved and then unsolved has to be more painful than I can imagine. The family has said, This crime not only took away a sister from her two brothers, it left a mother and a father without a daughter and a young child without a mother. Since then, the family has grown with nephews that will never meet their aunt and a grandchild that can only see grandma in pictures, only knowing her from shared memories. But I also have to commend the prosecutors for being willing to allow more time to collect evidence rather than potentially convict what could be an innocent man. In the meantime, I'd love to know what you think. Is Knapp's past strangling conviction too much of a coincidence to ignore? Or did the police get too comfortable too quickly? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for tuning into my YouTube video. I'm just a true crime fan like you are, and I really appreciate you taking a chance on me. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel if you like spending this time together. I'd be so appreciative. Until next time, I'm Katie, and this has been Katie Does Crime. Even freckles would be included in the snow called... Snow called... He'd once pleaded guilty and been convicted of assault of a sexual... No national database existed at the time. It was just... uh, Sorry. (laughs) His victim had been strangled, just like Audrey Frazier. This paragraph's hard. And as you know, DNA alone cannot solve any case. To solve a case requires investigative work, and this case involved amazing work and dedication by some of our outstanding detectives. And I'd like to introduce two of the detectives that worked on this case by Detective Corporal Neil Martin and Detective Dustin Galchaw from our major crimes team to discuss this case in further detail. Thank you.
afternoon. Uh, Detective Dustin Gottschall, Vancouver Police Department. Uh, Detective Neil Martin, uh, also Vancouver Police Department. Uh, July 16, 1994, units with the Vancouver Police Department responded to 8011 East 4th Plane. Uh, it's a, a apartment, uh, a group of apartments at that time was known as the Family Tree Apartments. Uh, initial investigation uh, was conducted and determined that the, there was a deceased inside an apartment. It was later identified as Aubrey Frazier, uh, made a name of Hayline. Uh, physical evidence was recovered at that scene, and that scene was processed and documented. Uh, detectives at that time followed up uh, with several leads uh, and used uh, preliminary DNA. Uh, I have to mention 1994 DNA was still a very early science, so the type of uh, scientific analysis that could be performed at that time was limited. Uh, but during the scope of the initial investigation, they were able to rule out uh, several different people or suspects in the case. Um, over a short course of time, the case unfortunately went cold. A lot of people were contacted and ruled out of the investigation, uh, and all leads at that time were exhausted. Uh, this case was uh, reopened several times since then. Um, and worked by several different detectives, making contact with other persons of interest, uh, obtaining uh, further physical evidence in the form of DNA, and ruling out um, all people that had been contacted so far. Uh, beginning in 2016 to 2017, uh, the Major Crimes Unit began digitizing cold cases and revisiting cold cases and determining if there was anything in the new in a more technological era, if there's things that could be done with cold cases to further them. Um, and began case reviews. Um, a detective was assigned the case and again went out and developed more investigative leads, uh, obtained more DNA samples, and kind of developed a viable suspect. In June of 2018, uh, information was obtained by the Major Crimes Unit uh, via a law enforcement conference of the um, of the, the lab, Parabon Nano Labs, uh, and their ability to potentially assist in helping uh, cold cases where uh, viable physical evidence in the form of DNA is present. Um, later in 2018, uh, our department reached out to Parabon, lab, Parabon Nano Labs um, for a composite at first, uh, a, uh, a snapshot is what they call it, that would give us uh, a better indication of what the person looked like uh, both uh, during the time period and age progressed uh, to today to include things like hair color, eye color, freckles, uh, to give us a better uh, understanding of what the person looked like during the time. Uh, after we received that work product uh, from Parabon Nano Labs, we asked them to further their uh, involvement in this case and asked them to uh, locate any viable information via um, genealogical websites uh, through places such as uh, GED Match. Um, based on this uh, request, they are able to provide us with a name uh, associated through their research, uh, which was uh, Richard Knapp. Uh, surveillance was then uh, conducted on Mr. Knapp, who was local to the area. Uh, after several months of surveilling this individual, uh, we were able to obtain uh, abandoned DNA uh, from that person. Uh, in the form of a cigarette butt. Uh, this uh, product was then sent to the Washington State Lab to compare it to the original um, source DNA from the crime scene, and we're informed that uh, that was a match at that time. Uh, we then uh, developed probable cause in conjunction with the Clark County Prosecutor's Office uh, for the arrest of Richard Knapp, uh, and that arrest took place this previous uh, Sunday. I've been in contact with the family um, since uh, for a few weeks now to keep them appraised of the, uh, the situation. Um, I can't tell you enough how um, happy they are that the case is still being actively worked, that an arrest has been made. Um, they have been through a lot. Um, Audrey left behind a, a small child when she uh, passed away. Um, and he's grown up without a mom, and they've grown up without a, a sister and a daughter for 25 years without any answers. And we were happy that we could provide them with uh, maybe not closure, but at least the next step uh, in the progression of this event. Um, it is an open investigation. We're still working um, uh, to make contact with witnesses and, and other investigative leads. 
Uh, so our, our information dissemination is quite limited at this time. Um, but it is an active and open case. Uh, if anybody uh, has information pertinent to this case now that an arrest has been made, uh, we welcome any contact. Uh, we'd like to cross all I's and dot all T's, if you will, to make sure that uh, this uh, case is thoroughly investigated and we make, uh, make sure that we've covered all investigative avenues. Um, that's all I have. I'll turn it over to Detective uh, Neil Martin if he has any other remarks. I think he covered it all, so I don't have anything. What was your name again, sir? Dustin Gottschall. Can you spell it? G-O-U-D-S-C-H-A-A-L. And your name again, sir? Uh, Mike Lester, L-E-S-T-E-R. Can you tell us more about how this works? So they're looking at a genealogical background, if you will. How did they come up with Richard Knapp's name out of that? Sure. So our understanding of that particular process uh, through Parabon Nano Labs is that they have uh, geneticists or people that are involved in ancestry type uh, research that will take the DNA and go back up a family tree of what they have. They have known reference samples that people provide to, uh, in this case, GED Match is a public open source database. Um, they'll so when people submit their DNA to that to try and find a cousin or an aunt or an uncle or a brother that they didn't know that they had, um, they'll, they'll take that DNA and see if there's any close matches with the unknown DNA. And then my understanding is they go back up the family tree and see where that intersects. And then they come back down with potential sources of who that DNA uh, belongs to or is closely associated with. Is the suspect known to the family? No, not that, not that I'm aware of. So he was a stranger? That's my understanding. Was he known, he wasn't known to the victim? At, at this point in our investigation, it does not appear that he was known to our victim, but it's still ongoing, so we're trying to confirm that. Unfortunately, information is a little bit more difficult to come by 25 years later, so. Has he committed any other crimes of this nature that you guys are aware of? So there are additional crimes, but I'll I'd have you defer until they actually read that in, in, during his first appearance. What was he doing at the time in this area, have you learned? In Vancouver? Uh -huh. uh, he's from the Southwest Washington area, so I think at that particular time he was, uh, my understanding would be partying and having a good time. How old was her child? How old, how old is her child now? I think he's in his so early 30s. Yeah, he's maybe, yeah, maybe not quite 30. I believe he was four or five, maybe closer to five when, when she passed away. And was she married at the time? or? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the legal status of her marriage was at that time. She was separated from her husband at that point in her life. And, uh, so what are the big challenges when you, I mean, this is like obviously a hugely technical process. What were some of the challenges you faced going through this? Uh, you know, the, the biggest challenge was trying to navigate and figure out how to work with, take the evidence from a government lab and get it sent over in a workable format to Parabon Nano Labs. Uh, th that whole process, I mean, you talk about genetics and DNA and stuff, and a lot of that's really kind of Greek to us. So um, it, it was the learning process of going through some of that and basically figuring out how to get uh, Parabon Nano Labs what they needed so that we could get a final report for what we needed. How'd you end up getting a cigarette butt? Uh, so uh, we basically just c conducted surveillance until we found him abandoned a cigarette butt and then we just collected it right after. Um, it would take a long time, several months of surveillance um, to find him do so in an open public area that we could then acquire the, the DNA work or the DNA um, product from. When was that? Uh, I believe that was earlier in this year. Um, I don't have a specific date, but probably around February, February, March of this year. So, so if I understand it right, please correct me if I'm wrong. He didn't submit his DNA for like genealogy purposes to uh, Parabon, right? Correct. Somebody else did that's in his family tree somewhere. Correct. And that's where they intersected and then it somehow Correct. figured out. Was yeah, this was not a, a casual connection that he had supplied his DNA to some sort of genealogy or, you know, like a ancestry.com or something like that. It was a kind of a reverse engineering from other family members that pointed to him. And his was already in the system for previous crimes? It was not. It was not in the CODA system at all. Or any system that we have legal access to. Had it been, you would have found that match in prior Correct. testing. Okay. 
Yes. So, and unfortunately, there's a, this misnomer that CODIS has all of these samples and profiles in there, and that's not necessarily the case. We have a lot of unidentified individuals. Um, so we may have a known sample, biological sample, from a criminal case, but we don't necessarily have a known or matching profile in CODIS for that. We, the, the science or the, the collection uh, from people or offenders hasn't necessarily caught up uh, to basically provide us all the matches that we wish we could say were in there. How widely is this system used? I mean, you guys are using it, obviously, but is this used by other agencies in the area, or? Which system, Parabon? Oh, yeah, all, all of this. Yeah. So I, I think Parabon's really come to the forefront in the last couple of years, and so I think you'll see more and more law enforcement agencies using it, um, because they can do things with the DNA to kind of provide us or, or point, give us investigative leads or steps. Um, so I, 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 you could probably go Google it, and you would probably find uh, multiple successful cases throughout the nation, not just Vancouver. How much does it cost? Uh, it varies. To, I mean, there's a cost for everything, right? So yeah. the, the initial snapshot cost, there was a base fee, and then for everything in addition that you wanted to do. So you could do uh, multiple age progressions. We only did 25 and 45 because there's a cost for each one above and beyond 25. Uh, there's an additional cost for the genealogy testing. So in, in this particular case, it was several thousand dollars. But much, do you know how much? I, I want to say it was around $6,800, I think. And are you spent. using this for other cases too? Absolutely. Which, which it, having said that, they're all, um, they're, it's based upon the facts and the, and the physical evidence that we have from each particular case. But we will be using this, my hope is, for all cases that um, would have a pattern that would allow us to use them. What is the standard? Is there like a standard that the chief has or something for when you can go through this process and spend this kind of money? I would imagine it would be. Not that I'm aware of. Again, it's it's case dependent. So I, I've had nothing but support from the police department in regards to any case that I brought forth um, with the potential to hopefully enhance our investigative ability to resolve something like this. What led investigators to reach out to Barabon last year? Was there a specific um, event that happened or was it just priority of cases? No, I, I think ultimately what led, led us to reach out to Parabon was we had attended part, part of our ongoing training. We had attended a conference. At that conference, uh, Parabon was a vendor there. They had some case studies that we thought might be applicable to some of our cases um, and some sex, uh, successful resolutions in regards to some of their cases um, that we thought would translate well within the city of Vancouver for some of our cool cases that have just been sitting on a shelf. So, What had Mr. Knapp been doing when you arrested him? Like, what was he doing in these last few years? You said he's still in the area. Yeah, so yeah, my understanding in, in conducting surveillance of him is um, I think what you expect any working 57 year old person to be doing going to work and going home. And where did he work? Uh, he worked in the, the Portland Airport area. At Portland Airport? Not for Portland Airport, but in the Portland Airport area is all I can really say at this time. And just to clarify one more time, so so this company identified family tree kind of relatives, and it sounds like they were the ones who said you might want to look at Correct. Richard. Okay. Oh yes, they get all the credit. We would have figured that out. You guys obviously you were pretty young. You guys weren't here in '94. I'm assuming no, no. Okay, just didn't know if you guys had any connection to the case. You're, you're out of high school. And I think he was still in high school. So. <laughs> um, so taking this kind of over, I guess, from uh, kind of a cold case, really, just you know, coming out of cold, how does it feel to, as uh, police detectives, to solve this? Well, I, I mean, obviously, solving cold cases is, is a good feeling. Um, I, I, I feel for the previous detectives' work in this because there was a lot of ups and downs with that investigation, and they didn't have some of the tools that obviously we have now. Um, you know, we have the the ability to get a hold of a lab that does lab stuff and gives us an answer. Um, so I don't, I don't want to take away from their previous attempts, which is really just street work, which was a lot of just making contact with people and establishing a, a rapport with them and getting them convinced that it's in their best interest to submit a DNA sample if they even want to. And so there was a lot of, uh, a lot of legwork that they did um, that I don't want to um, disregard, um, but. It's, it's a great feeling. It's a great f feeling for the family. I, I, I know that in my personal context with them, that's, that's the joy I get out of this is 
nothing that's going to come from this case or what potentially could happen to Mr. Knapp. It's that phone call I was allowed to make to um, her brother and notification I made in person to her son that something was happening and it was happening soon. Taking a step back, what are some of the challenges in solving cold cases that are just old? So, and I, I think, and we've talked, some of the, the misnomers I think sometimes is that in every cold case there's going to be this type of evidence and then thereby we can solve every cold case by just sending something to a lab and they tell us who did it. Um, so some of the challenges are few of our cold cases have the abundance of physical evidence in this form of DNA that allowed us to solve this case. Those are, are sometimes few and far between and the longer the cold case is, the least likely you're going to have that physical evidence or the ability to trace it back to somebody who might be living that can then get you, you know, closer to the person involved. Um, so while it's great for solving cold cases, it's probably only solving a, a small percentage, unfortunately. So it relies on like a break, would you say? Somewhat. And yeah. Then, and, and then additionally, I mean, people move away. They leave the area. Uh, you, they lose track with one another, people die or pass away, and so that makes it difficult because a lot of the information we're relying on is either written down in a report and we still need to be able to find someone that can testify to what occurred back on that day for the prosecutor's office. Uh, fortunately, in this case, all of the detectives that have previously worked this are still around, uh, knock on wood, as, as well as uh, several of the witnesses that were around during that time period. So unfortunately, some people have passed away in this case, but not... Um, not anybody that would have, I think, greatly affect the outcome. Can you briefly share the family's reaction when you informed them that there was finally an arrest? Uh, so I, I made contact with the brother who uh, resides in South Dakota. Um, he, I think he was a little panicked at first. He hadn't had contact in several years. Um, uh, but when I informed him uh, that we were close to making an arrest, um, he was emotional. And the first thing he wanted to do was put a his dad on like a third party line and that was an emotional experience as well because the the father's you know getting older in age and and he told me that he thought he was going to go to his grave without any resolution as to what happened to his daughter um, so that that was tough um, but it was a great phone call and and like I mentioned before I, I was I was glad I was put in a position to make that call it was a fantastic rewarding experience um, they've been great. They've been uh, full of questions. Um, I've had contact with him very frequent. Um, but, you know, the distance away, they haven't been in the Vancouver area for a long time. So um, they, they were super, super thrilled with it. And you said you personally told her son, too. Did you go Correct. to South Dakota for that? No, her, her son's still general uh, to the area, so I was able to do that in person. Mm -hmm. um, and. They're, they make you feel good, but at the same time, it's it's hard. It's hard news. Um, you know, people don't anticipate getting a phone call in the middle of 25 years later. Hey, this is wrapping up. So um, he was very um, happy with the resolution, um, but I think he also, um, unfortunately, didn't get to know his mom very well in the, the short time he spent with her. You guys arrested Mr. Knapp. Did uh, everything go fine? Was he? Did he expect it? Did he understand why? I mean, his demeanor, I guess, or kind of what, what, what happened on Sunday? Or what was it like on Sunday? I, there was nothing dynamic to it. Um, it. There was nothing that was really out of the ordinary. Um, as to his reaction, I, I can't really comment on that. Um, but... Uh, uh, well, where and how was he arrested? He was arrested in uh, just a... a nearby his, his residence in Fairview, Oregon. On a traffic stop? Correct. I guess we'll know. You mentioned he may be facing other charges in this case, but does he have a prior record? Uh, so that, that information will probably be all expunged during his initial, um, and I should have probably mentioned that it's our understanding that he uh, did make extradition, so he's currently lodged um, at Clark County Jail at this moment. And I would anticipate probably his appearance being tomorrow morning.